I see myself up and running on my screen. All right, welcome everybody to our third anniversary live Q and A. Hopefully everybody's hearing me loud and clear and we are up to go. All right, so I've got a batch of questions and answers that have flowed in through a variety of sources so far. Uh, I wanna start off with some Q and A from my patrons who sent me quite a few notes here that they wanted to go over. So I'm going to go ahead and start them. We're going to jump into a variety of different questions that I've gotten either by email or across uh, 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 different mediums. Uh, but I will be getting to your Q&A too. So a couple of things real quick. If you want to have uh, a question answered in today's Q&A, just go ahead and submit it in the comments. Just put question in front of yours and capitalize everything so that it will stand out and I will try to flag them. Uh, as they come in, uh, we are once again a one man show here. So always trying to make sure that things are working correctly. And if I don't get to your question, my apologies, I'm going to go ahead and try to get to everyone's questions. All right. First question of the day comes from Patreon, and this is from Steve and Jan. Uh, they recently did a trip to Seville, Spain. Very uh, jealous there. Great maritime museum there. Uh, where they saw a uh, Spanish dispatch vessel. And the thing they asked me is this, Spain was once a great sea power. Is the United States fa falling into the same trap as Spain and will soon be overtaken by China? Well, I think that's a big theme that I talk about a lot here is where does the U.S. stand in terms of its maritime dominance? Spain was a colonial power and its power was waning. And when you look at the U.S. performance against Spain in the Spanish-American War of 1898, it was absolutely abysmal. Uh, uh, Spain, if you look at, for example, the Battle of Manila Bay, one of the most lopsided battles in American history, the only American casualty in the entire battle was a coal stoker who actually keeled over because of a heart attack. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. Navy sailed into Manila Bay, fired on the Spanish fleet, pulled out, had lunch, and then came back in and finished it off. And at any time in the battle, when you have a meal break, pretty much shows you're in a good position. Spain did not invest and did not have the capability. I don't think we're anywhere near that with Spain, uh, but I do think we need to be aware of, of what's going on. So I do believe that we need to be cognizant of issues as we progress. It, it's very easy to get very kind of complacent and not to be uh, kind of aware of what is happening. All right, next question I got here is from Gary Mitchell. Uh, what does flag of registry actually mean and how easy is it to change flags? So flag of registry is the registry, the flag you fly off your ship. And changing registry is always easy. It is a big problem. I have one of my real big issues I have with the International Maritime Organization, which is the UN shipping arm, and they are the ones who kind of oversee global shipping. And I've got a lot of them. I got a long list of issues with the IMO, is the ability of nation or ships to switch out flags. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that with the Dark Fleet, with ships heading over to the Gabon, uh, Gabon registry, uh, others over to Tanzania. There's a whole batch of registries out there that have a lot of uh, uh, issues. And so I think there needs to be a little bit more oversight in how you allow uh, companies uh, or shipping firms to go over it. I think the biggest issue, however, is not registry right now. It's who is the clear beneficial owner of a ship. We're seeing this all the time right now uh, with uh, uh, ships being attacked by the Houthi. We don't know who actually owns them because it goes through shell corporations and dummy corporations in Liberia, in the Marshall Islands, and a whole batch of other places. So we really need to have a better oversight of that. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump over here to one of our first questions here, because I want to make sure I'm covering questions of everybody who's here. So uh, let's see, uh, one of the questions, actually, I'm going to come back to Lane's question here in a minute. I want to get to the beginning here. There we go. All right, right here. So first question by Trek Rider. Any thoughts on the U.S. and Australia submarine deal? This is AUKUS, the uh, Australian-U.S.-U.K. deal. Do you believe the United States has the extra shipbuilding capacity to supply Australia with Virginia-class submarines? So I just did a video on shipbuilding uh, and the 30-year shipbuilding plan. 
the U.S. Navy is just now getting up to speed to building two Virginia-class submarines a year. They're also in the process of building what's called the District of Columbia-class ballistic missile submarines. Now, back in the Cold War, we were building five nuclear submarines a year without a problem, but then we went down to one in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And now we're ratcheting back up. I do think that the U.S. can get its industrial base back up. I think the biggest problem that we see with the industrial base is the lack of the U.S. really investing in the industrial base and the unmixed uh, kind of the uh, uh, mixed messages that are sent by the U.S. government to the shipbuilders. I think uh, shipbuilders would love to be able to build more ships. They just need a commitment from the U.S. government. The problem is that the U.S. government is continually changing commitments. They're changing specifications. It's very hard for U.S. shipbuilders to really prepare adequately for this. All right, go to a question I had uh, on the comments here for this video beforehand. So this comes from at Franklin PC 3 XD. Uh, Matson, I sold my hedge position. My, my he I sold or hedged my long position last month. Uh, goes on for now. The tankers and bulkers, or two, are the market darlings in the maritime. Is Matson's U.S. flag an advantage or disadvantage in the pre World War III environment? Well, first off, I hope we're not in World War III. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that we are avoiding that uh, situation. Uh, I, I don't think uh, that's a prospect. I, I think it, Matson has a very unique advantage. As you know, there's very few container companies you can actually buy interest in. Matson, uh, you have interest in uh, uh, Zim, uh, but there's not a lot of publicly, at least not U.S. publicly traded companies. You can go on foreign stock exchange and see them, but definitely not a, a lot. And so I think Matson is in a unique position. I do think that there is a target right now on Matson's back. Uh, China has introduced some new shipping lines into the equation to do some express service from the east coast of Asia to the west coast of the United States, smaller vessels. Uh, they're going to try to get in there and be able to undercut Matson. Matson was really uh, in a great position during the supply chain because its smaller vessels allowed him to turn around faster. It also meant that they could basically uh, go into their dedicated port they had in Long Beach and offload. So Matson was always a good one. Uh, and right now we're seeing Matson getting ready to build three new ships up in Philadelphia. That's good news. They're replacing three of their older ships that are on the West Coast Alaska run. But there needs to be a lot more support and infrastructure for a company like Matson to compete on the foreign market. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to another question here. Let's see. Uh, so this is from Mr. Jumbly. Have you seen much on the light replenishment oiler program and what it is and how it, it how it is to be used? The Navy decom list had less LCSs on. What is the plan for? Is there a repair plan for them? So again, I just did that video on shipbuilding. It's out there for everybody to take a look at. Uh, the light replenishment vessel is a supplement to the larger replenishment vessel. So right now we're having a problem. I didn't make, go into a lot of detail in the video, but we have a new replacement replenishment vessel called the John Lewis class. Three of them have now been built, but none of them are in service yet because of issues with the vessels. Uh, there are problems with them and problems enough that the fourth vessel is being modified because of the problems in the first three. Now, as we usually do in the United States, we've already started phasing out the older vessels before the new ones are actually in service, which means that we are short right now in replenishment vessels to the point that over last month, there were not enough replenishment vessels along the east coast of the United States for Navy destroyers to use. So I think that was, uh, it's a problem. And the, the light replenishment vessel is intended to be a supplement, uh, kind of like a smaller version. I think, again, as I mentioned in that video, we can get designs for those vessels off the shelf from a lot of countries. Uh, Korea, for example, built a design for uh, the British, the Tide class. I think uh, very easily we could go ahead and do something similar. All right. Let me pull up a question here that I had. Uh, this is from David McDonald, 5102. Uh, request for timely updates. A status of the World Central Kitchen Ramadan Relief Maritime Humanitarian Mission and the status of the U.S. government amphib pier and maritime relief operations. So uh, World uh, 
Central Kitchen is still doing relief operations. They have loaded their second vessel. It should be sailing any day now, heading to that makeshift jetty off the coast of Gaza. The U.S. vessels are all en route. Uh, the Besson, which is the first of the Army vessels, stopped in the Azores. Uh, the other vessels are behind, as I mentioned to you before, they are slow. These are not fast crossings. Uh, the ship that's loaded with the floating cause, or excuse me, loaded with the Trident Pier, sailed from Norfolk. It's going to fly past the other vessels and get into a holding position and wait. And then two other vessels are loading up with Navy uh, amphibious and watercraft that's going to head over. This is a long process. It's going to take a long. Understand, after the Cold War, we really gutted our logistics. In particularly, one of the things we did was shut down a lot of our overseas placements. So a lot of this stuff used to be either afloat on afloat prepositioning ships or stored in areas like Hythe or Hit. I, I know you said it wrong, but it's in Southern England near Portsmouth. Hith, I think I can't remember how to say it right. But we closed down that facility, which means that all of that has got to come out of Virginia. And so now what we're seeing is a, a long delay in getting there. I go back to my issue with what the government is setting up. And I'm going to have an update this week on the floating pier and the deployment of the army vessels. I'm going to try something a little new. I'm not sure everyone's going to like it, but we'll see. Uh, but I'll have an update on it. I, I worry about the security issue. I think the security issue is the big problem when it comes to this. So uh, I, I think we're, we're seeing a, a lot of issues with this. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to our next question here. Here we go. Oop, actually, I jumped ahead here. Uh, this one right here. So this is from our Jagman, who has criminal jurisdiction on the pirates arrested, the flag state of the hijacked vessel or the arresting coastal state. Right now, the situation in the Red Sea and HRA is what's going on. OK, so I, I did this in my update on the Red Sea, just talked about that. So the Indian Navy, which took back the MV Ruan and matter of fact, Ruan just showed up off the coast of Oman. The Ruan was taken down by the Indian Navy, uh, the, the INS Kolkata and uh, Indian Marco, Marcos, uh, Marine Commandos, took down the vessel. They arrested 35 pirates on board. Under Article 105 of UNCLAWS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, a ship in international waters that's been pirated can be attacked and taken down by any nation state. In this case, it was India. And under Article 105, India has the right to basically deal with the jurisdictional issues, the prosecution of those pirates. In 2022, India passed a Maritime Security Act. And I talk about that in the video I just did on this on the Red Sea. They passed a Maritime Security Act, which gives them the right to try the 35 prison, the 35 pirates in Indian court. And that's what we believe is about to happen. We're going to go see those pirates basically tried in the court. So that is a big change of, of what we're seeing. India has been very out front here in trying to basically uh, curtail piracy across the board. And uh, they are doing a extremely good job at that. All right, let me go to one of my questions here that I had earlier from people who submitted earlier. So from David Sorello, 7976, you are a boring weirdo. David, I'm going to disagree with you immensely. I am not boring. I, I, I take exception with that. All right, let's go to our next question right there. You'll see I do take comments from everybody here. So let's look at our next comment here. There we go. This is from Lane to uh, Tatum. Indicators say China wants to invade Taiwan. Do you have any idea of when? Well, I don't because uh, Xi Jinping doesn't really coordinate with me on when we think uh, China's going to invade Taiwan. Let me give you what some people think. So the military operates under a idea that was put forward by a former head of the uh, Indo-PACOM, the India Pacific Command. And that is that 2027 is when in, uh, China would be in the best position to do it. Uh, we will be at our lowest state of readiness in 2027. Uh, China would be at one of its highest. So there's that window there. However, let me say this. I don't think China, and I got to be careful about this. 
I don't believe China wants to invade Taiwan. I think they want Taiwan back in China, but I don't think they want to invade China. I think they want to dominate China. I think they want to do the slow burn of incorporating Taiwan back into their country. And they'll do that economically. They'll do it socially. They'll do it politically. They will do this over the long kind of burn. The variable here that you have to be careful about is a 70-year-old leader who has no checks and balances on him, and that's Xi. Uh, if Xi wants to invade Taiwan, he will. You know, By all accounts, nobody really thought Russia was going to invade Ukraine. But when you have Vladimir Putin, who has no checks and balances on him, that is the variable that we see happen. And so uh, I think that is uh, a big issue that we see, is, is how China will do it. I think China loses more by invading Taiwan. Right now, I mean, Taiwan's building their own ships in China. They're, they're in an economic relationship in terms of global shipping. I, I don't know what China gets out of invading Taiwan. A lot of people will sit there and say, well, China is stockpiling just massive amounts of resources. That is because if you look at the history of China, they know what happened to them in the 1930s. You really got to understand Chinese history in the 20th century when Japan basically cut them off from the outside world and basically tried to strangle them. And what we saw happen was the same exact thing happened to Japan. How we defeated Japan in World War II was through Operation Strangulation. We cut them off. Yes, we dropped a uh, uh, atomic bomb on them, uh, two of them to be exact, but there was a lot of other issues at play. So I think China is playing a long game. I think the Belt and Road Initiative is intended to provide this uh, level of trade and protection for them. But I do think you need to be aware of it because there is always that chance that Xi does it. All right, let's go ahead and jump to another question I got here. Uh, this is from Fluke196C. Uh, question and answer, what is your background? How do you know so much about shipping? Can you make money off of it through speculation? Okay, so let's do the, the background. So my background was I was a merchant mariner. I went to the State University of New York Maritime College. Uh, I did a four-year degree where I got my unlimited third mate's license. And I took, I was a, I was a marine transportation major with a minor in port operations, which I thought I would never, ever use, to tell you the truth, because all I wanted to do was sail ships. And I did. I went out, I sailed ships for four years, and then I worked ashore for the maritime industry for another four years. And I got to the point, and I was working with the U.S. government and doing that, and I got to the point where you either stay in the government, you get out. I decided to get out. I uh, then undertook a academic background. I got my master's in maritime history and nautical archaeology from East Carolina University. So I worked in the nautical archaeology side for a bit. Then I went to Alabama, got my PhD in military naval history, wrote my doctoral dissertation on the role of the merchant marine in national defense, taught at a batch of schools. But in 2008, I became an adjunct professor at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, teaching a course, a graduate level course in maritime industry policy. So I started writing about not just maritime history, but maritime policy. And then this plucky little YouTube channel came about three years ago when myself and John Conrad did the very first episode of what's going on with shipping. Uh, grand total, I think about 3,000 views at the time we did it, talking about Ever Given. And it's been running ever since. Uh, the other questions that Fluke had here... How do you know so much about shipping? There you go. Uh, can you make money off it through speculation? So I, I, I will be upfront. I do invest in shipping. Uh, I've done fairly well in investing in shipping. I will say I've, I'm, I'm about my funds that I have allocated for shipping. I am up probably over twenty, about twenty five percent overall over the past few years. Uh, but I will warn you that shipping is a very fluky topic. It's very tough to invest in because it doesn't act normally. Uh, it is all over the place because so many people don't know about it. And so therefore you get a lot of people who invest in shipping and they have no idea whatsoever about uh, uh, the shipping is issue. And so therefore what you wind up seeing is a, uh, uh, a lot of times the industry reacts not the way you expect. But long term, there's a lot of interest that can be made in in long term. So, for example, I I I made a lot of money investing in the cruise lines when everything went to the bottom in 2020 because I knew they were going to come back. Uh, however, now you got to be very careful with them because of their uh, positions and the loans they took out. They're they're in a very kind of dicey situation these days. All right, let's go ahead and head over to our next one here. Let's see. Here we go. 
uh, let me jump over here. Uh, again, from Lane, do you know any of uh, do you know of any new future shipbuilding efforts in the U.S.? So the big future ship effort, I would say, is two right now. One of them is the building of the uh, uh, the national uh, multi mission security vessels. These are the school training ships. Empire State is up at SUNY Maritime. Uh, Patriot State, the uh, Massachusetts ship is due to go next. The third one is coming together for Maine. I think it's state of Maine. I can't remember our Bay State. I can't. No, no, it's state of Maine. Uh, Bay State would, would, would have been Massachusetts. Uh, and then it's Texas and then California. And then right behind them, as I mentioned, is the three ships for Matson. Uh, there is a program to build new ferries for the Washington State that's under uh, evaluation right now. And then there is a, all, a whole batch of, uh, of, uh, of issues at play here that are in place for a lot of smaller vessels. All right. Uh, this one from Eric. Eric and I have been going back and forth. Eric's a uh, NC Wolfpack fan. My wife is a Tar Heel. The uh, March Madness is going on basketball here in North Carolina. So both teams made the Sweet 16. But Eric asked this question, uh, how did you end up at Campbell? So for those of you who don't know, I am a, uh, I am an associate professor of uh, history at Campbell University. I'm the chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science. My wife went to law school. Actually, Campbell University is in Harnett County of North Carolina, just south of Raleigh. This is where my wife grew up. And so she knew uh, about this uh, for a long time. And so she uh, had uh, an idea of the school. Uh, I was looking for places to basically uh, come and basically teach. And I'd started teaching here as an adjunct professor a long time ago when I first started teaching. And then uh, I kind of built a reputation here at Campbell. And then when the position opened up, the full-time position in 2010, I put in for it and I was able to get it. I became chair about three years ago. Uh, so I do a lot at Campbell. I'm the chair of the department. I'm also the university's faculty athletic rep. So I actually help with eligibility and determining eligibility of student athletes, which is a whole issue onto itself. All right, let's go ahead over here now. Let's see, take a look at our next question. So this is from uh, Avatello 100. Why did the United States not sign UN Article 105 seizure of a pirate ship or aircraft for your Q&A on Sunday? Uh, so this was an issue that was actually raised uh, at, in one of the videos. So obviously he watched the video I talked about. Uh, understand the United States didn't just ratify Article 105. We did not ratify UNCLOS at all. And what we did was, even though we helped pass UNCLOS, the UN Convention of Law at Sea in, in 1982, the U.S. has never ratified. It needs two-thirds of the Senate, 67 votes in the Senate to ratify. And as you know, if you follow U.S. politics, it would be hard to get 67 senators today to confirm that today is Sunday. It would be just difficult. So there are issues, but there are issues. There was issue with undersea uh, mining rights. Uh, there were issues with a whole series of elements of it. Unfortunately, th those issues have been kind of overtaken by events. We really need to ratify UNCLOS because we, we follow the tenets of UNCLOS. Yet there are some countries that sign UNCLOS that don't. I will give you the example of China. And what China is doing to the Philippines right now is a classic example. Just uh, images out the other day of the... Chinese Coast Guard, which is not like the U.S. Coast Guard. Let's be clear about that. The Chinese Coast Guard is kind of a militant kind of arm of the Chinese. They are not doing ship inspections. That's the MSA. That's the Maritime Security Agency that does that. The Chinese Coast Guard is trying to enforce Chinese unclaws, uh, EEZs, the Economic Exclusion Zones. And so they use water cannons to attack Philippine vessels. Uh, it's really, really nasty and extremely, extremely dangerous. All right, let's look at the next question. So from Robert Armstrong, when will there be 25,000 TEU containers? Well, Robert, there are. We've, I think we just surpassed up to that level or if we're very close. I can't remember if it's 24,000 or 25,000. However, I will say this, Robert, one of the things I've, I talked about fairly recently is because of the, the diversion around the Suez, that has opened up the limits really for ships to get bigger. One of the things that has halted the growth of container ships is the limits put on by the Suez. You can't be longer than basically uh, 400 meters. Uh, so you have ships that are 399.99 meters long uh, length. We may ships go longer. And if they go longer, that means that they can carry more containers. I don't know if we're going to go wider. Wider is a problem because you need uh, larger cranes to do that. But if you go longer, 
than 1400 feet, then you can carry more containers. And the thing that have promoted the growth of container ships in the past have been diversions around the uh, uh, Suez. Uh, and so we're definitely seeing that issue kind of manifest itself. So uh, I, I think that issue is is one of those ones that we we keep kind of seeing come back again. Are we going to see issues of ship growth continue? Because again, if we see ship growth continue, then uh, you know the, the limit is there. The only thing that prevents l literally the limit of ships is going to be um, uh, the question of uh, port sizes and whether or not uh, insurance can be obtained for them. So I, I think that issue in itself is, is a big one. All right, let's go back to some of our other questions here. I apologize, trying to get to as many as I can. So from right uh, with the advent of the CG-47 class cruisers, these are the Ticonderogas all being retired, is there room or relevancy for a large surface craft? Have the quality of, quantity of the excellent DDG-51 class made this moot? So I, I do cover military here, and I'll talk about this for just one second. The Arleigh, uh, the Arleigh Burke class destroyers are about to reach their plateau. In other words, starting in 2027, we're going to start retiring them because they're over. They're going to be over 40 years old. It's a 1980s design. The first ship, the Arleigh Burke, came in the service in 1991, I believe. So they're going to start being retired. Uh, they have new versions of the Arleigh Burks coming out, the Flight 3s. You will see one called the Muffin Top uh, uh, Arleigh Burks. These are ships that have this big kind of... Uh, 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 protrusion on the side of the vessel jutting out. Uh, you are seeing some of the flight threes. They're going to be, the flight threes are designed to replace the cruisers. So they're going to be the anti-air warfare vessels. So if you look at the Eisenhower deployed to the Red Sea, we have a whole batch of Arleigh Burke destroyers, four of them providing guards. But there's one ship, the Philippine Sea, the cruiser rides roughshod on the on the Eisenhower. That's its missile defense. We will see that be replaced by at least one Arleigh Burke Flight 3 destroyer going forward. Unfortunately, the U.S. blew shipbuilding in terms of Navy coming out of the Cold War. There was supposed to be a whole generation of new cruisers, destroyers, and light combat ships. The only thing we got out of that program was the LCSs. And I am not going to go down an LCS rabbit hole because it doesn't, it never ends well when you start talking about LCS. All right. Uh, this is from Chris. I've heard the idea floated of a fifth public shipyard. Do you think that really would be a good idea when NAVC is currently struggling to support the four it currently has? No, Chris, I don't. I, I think a fifth public uh, yard is a mistake for, for this reason. Number one, I would love to have a fifth public yard. I would love to have more shipyards. But right now we're not using the shipyards efficiently as it is. Uh, we need to get better at that. Uh, plus, private yards are not being used efficiently. Plus, where are you going to put a fifth yard? I, I, I mean, you're talking about a huge upfront infrastructure. You can start back up Hunter's Point, which is down in San Francisco. You may be able to take back over Philly Shipyard, get it up and running. But I do think that you create a lot of problems there. The the issues I have, and I really recommend if you don't follow Chris Cavus and the Cavus Ship Podcast, if you're if you follow military, follow him. He did a whole batch of interviews with shipyard CEOs and owners. They went down to the shipyards, and there is capacity in our shipyards. Understand that the the big trait over the past 20, 30 years has been consolidation of shipyards. And I don't mean just in the US, I mean globally. Since 2009, 40% of the world's shipyards have closed or consolidated together. That means that we're seeing less capacity in our shipyards. And that is a major, major problem. We need to be investing uh, in that type of infrastructure. A fifth yard would be great, but we need to be more efficient. And understand we have four public yards, Portsmouth, Norfolk, Puget Sound, and Pearl Harbor. And they are absolutely essential. I would argue that Pearl Harbor and Puget Sound are two of the most important ones right now. Uh, if you look at World War II, and I've studied World War II extensively, the reason we were able to keep our Navy and, and surpass the Japanese Navy in the early parts of the war is because we had massive repair facilities at Pearl Harbor and at Puget Sound. Aircraft carriers that were damaged in battle, Saratoga, Yorktown, just before Midway, for example, classic example, were able to get fixed and back out enterprise during the Guadalcanal campaign. 
battleships and cruisers that were hit went to Puget Sound and those that couldn't fit there went to the East Coast. We were able to put ships back into combat when the Japanese took twice as long. And then our shipbuilding capacity allowed us to bring in an entirely new fleet to bear in 1943. Uh, it was an amazing uh, endeavor. It really is impressive. All right. Let me go to another question here that was turned into us. Okay. Let me see. Uh, this is from Frank Lee Netsy. I have a question, Sal. Uh, uh, why is India's Navy stepping up to the position of protecting merchant shipping vessels? Is it to develop needed expertise in naval operations or to develop itself into a larger naval power for the future needs, i.e. counterweighting the People's Liberations Army Navy? I, I think you answered the question right there. I think the Indian Navy, and I've talked about the Indian Navy, been a little bit of a fanboy here of the Indian Navy, that the Indian Navy has done exceptionally well. Uh, in its ability to not just get forces out, it's been a massive deployment. I don't think people appreciate how many ships the uh, Navy has put out there, the Indian Navy has put out there. It's been a lot of uh, forces, and they have been key in providing assistance uh, to uh, uh, ships that have been in distress. I'm thinking Marlon Wanda. I'm thinking MSC Sky 2. Uh, I am also thinking uh, the fact that the Indian Navy is – wanting to assert itself as a major force in the Indian Ocean. And that is a threat to China. China always sees not so much us as a big threat, but as other powers as a threat, and particularly the Indian Navy. If you come out of the top of the Malacca Straits into the Indian Ocean, the Indians are developing a massive naval base at the Adaman Islands. These are just at the exit of the Malacca Straits. That's a big threat to China. China is worried. You understand, when you sail out of a U.S. port, there is no encumbrance. You sail out largely in the international waters, the exception being Seattle, Tacoma, where you have Canada on one side, the U.S. on the other. But almost every other U.S. port dumps out into international waters. If you're China, you dump out into the East China Sea. But to get to the open ocean, you got to get past what is referred to as the first island chain. That means going through straits that are controlled by South Korea, Japan, Russia, the United States with its base on Okinawa, Taiwan. Uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and now India. And so this creates a, a little bit of, of, of problems in this. <laughs> Ariel asked me a question. Is my clock right in the back? It's not. My, obviously, my, 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 uh, my uh, battery died on my clock. I apologize. It, it, it's not. We are stuck in time, actually, Ariel. So sorry. I was really going through questions, and I noticed that in the back. That's a great question. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead to our next question. Let me get to my next question here on the list. Here we go. So from Kevin Thomas, will you visit the battleship New Jersey and dry dock at the Philadelphia Navy Yard? So, uh, man, there have been battleships at sea like crazy. It's been crazy about the number of battleships we've seen. Texas was underway, and now New Jersey got underway from Camden, heading down to the uh, Philly shipyard. I would love to go up on it. I'm not sure I'm going to get an invite to go up in it, uh, so I'm not sure. I've actually been – I was actually on Wisconsin and Missouri when they were active in the U.S. Navy during the first Persian Gulf War. I've been on Wisconsin down in Norfolk. The only battleship actually I haven't been on is uh, is New Jersey, I think. I think uh, uh, New Jersey, uh, no, Iowa. But I, I did just get asked to go on the Iowa uh, podcast for the battleship. If you don't follow the Battleship New Jersey on YouTube, you should. Uh, Ryan Szymanski, who is the head curator of the Battleship New Jersey, does a fantastic YouTube channel. Battleship New, Jer New Jersey YouTube channel, great. They have a backdrop of a battleship. I'm very envious of that. They do a, they do that. And so they put together a great YouTube channel. Really strongly recommend it. I love museum ships. I actually want to put a program together. If I could ever do it, I want to put it together where I put together a program where you go and tour museum ships through time. You know, start off with something like Constitution, go on down and go look at Constellation in Baltimore, go look at the Monitor and Merrimack at the Mariners Museum, go to Olympia up in Philadelphia, go check out Texas, and then go to the modern battleships and aircraft carriers. And it kind of takes you through history. Uh, I think that is a lot of fun. I love learning history through material culture. I think it's the archaeologist in me. I, I really enjoy that a lot. All right, next question here. Do you foresee the demand for freight forwarding services to increase, or do you think companies will start handling their imports, exports, and house? I, I do. I, I think freight forwarding is the way to go. One of the things we saw during the global supply, uh, supply chain crisis, and understand where my channel took off, wasn't ever given getting stuck in the supply in, in the Suez. It was the supply chain crisis that in September of 
2021, when I started talking about, and I want to thank, I, I wish I knew who gave me this comment. I, I don't know. And I wish kicks me that I don't know this, but I had a, uh, I was doing the, uh, the Suez crisis and I was doing what's going on in the Suez. That was the name of the channel initially. And then somebody came up and just sent me a note one day and said, Sal, there's other ships. You should be looking at this other thing, like the supply chain crisis. And I morphed over to do that. And it was the best advice I ever got. And uh, the supply chain crisis demonstrated there was an issue in the supply chain crisis where companies like Amazon, Home Depot, Ikea were chartering ships. And everybody started asking the question, well, does this mean that, that these companies are going to start operating ships? And the answer is no. It, it, it's too expensive. It's too difficult. Freight forwarders keep you out of trouble. I was just up in Boston uh, last week for an event. I spoke at BOC International, which is a freight forwarder. And understand what freight forwarders do. They're, they're kind of like the travel agents, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the services you can use, Expedia to go book flights and do everything for you. Uh, they put all that information together and work for you. But the biggest danger most shippers don't understand is the liability and insurance issue. The biggest one, I'll give you the best example of this. You want to ship your own personal goods overseas. Uh, this, this is the classic case that happened when Ever Forward went aground off of Baltimore. I went on the Odd Lots podcast on Bloomberg. And one of the hosts of the Odd Lots uh, 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 podca uh, podcast, Tracy, had her goods on board the ship. And they were stuck. And the ship declared something called general average. So if you ever ride in an Uber or a taxi and that car gets into an accident, you're not responsible. It's the driver of the vehicle that's responsible. You're just you know riding along. On a ship, your cargo riding on the ship, you are responsible. You share part of the responsibility. And if you don't have insurance for that, then you could pay a huge amount of cost to get your goods back. That's what uh, you see with uh, freight forwarders. They're very good at ensuring that you are covered and protected about this. They can also help direct your cargo when it gets stuck somewhere, which unfortunately happens a lot. All right, let me jump to my next question here. Uh, Bama BLD 66. Thank you for your, your, uh, video. I have a question for you. I'm going to go down here because a little bit, uh, my concern is the number of fatal accidents in the U S Navy from say 1775 forward to date. I happened upon a list that was shocking to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so he's asking about accidents in the U S Navy. Let me talk about the Navy because it was just a report out on, uh, a engineering casualty on board USS Boxer one of the large deck amphibs and uh, i did a video a long time ago on a uh, bonham richard uh, even before i started the channel when the bonham richard fire if you go to my very beginning for videos i did some uh, live stream videos of bonham richard fire and then uh, on my channel i did a series of videos on that fire especially when the report came out that showed the impact of the fire and one of the things that I, I talked about on that fire was the amazing, you know, I read the Jagman report on it. It was like, I forget, 300 pages. I can't remember how long it was, but it was a really long report. And every time I turned the page of that report, I was shocked by what I read. And I literally would tell myself, okay, this is the dumbest thing I have ever seen. There's no way this could get worse. And then I would turn the page and it got worse every time. It was, it, it was horrific. Uh, it was really bad. And so I, I, I worry that the U.S. Navy is kind of declining and not paying attention to things. So we just had the issue with the boxer sister ship of Bonham Richard. They were running the ship without lube oil in the reduction gear. This is like running your car without oil in your engine, basically. Not so much, but basically, that's the end result is going to be the same. You're going to seize up your, your, your reduction gear. It's a huge cost. The fact that they ran it for two hours without oil is, 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 I don't even know how it's possible. I really don't. I don't even know how they did that. And then we're seeing just a myriad of issues that are really undermining the U.S. Navy. And I, I have concern about that. I, I really have concern. And sometimes when I do videos like that, I get comments like, why are you bashing? Why are you showing our weakness? And it's not because I want to show weakness. I want us to fix the weakness so that that weakness cannot be uh, um, exploited by nations and states that are against us. So I, I, I try to be as, as, as level-headed as I can. I do worry about the alarming set, uh, uh, number of accidents we have, the number of commanding officers that get relieved. Uh, it is it is a ongoing problem. All right, let's go to another question here. 
LDF Simp, do you foresee the demand? Oh, I did that one already. I apologize. I'll go to the next question there. Sorry. There we go. Uh, Palmer Monson, studying naval architecture next year in college. I'm super excited. Do you have any reading recommendations remotely re related to the ship and the ocean? So I will give you a, uh, if you're going to be a naval arc, you need to read a book on the uh, uh, SS United States about William Francis Gibbs. Uh, Steve, Stephen Ujafusa, I believe his name, uh, uh, wrote a book called The Man and His Ship. It is the best. Uh, read that book. You want to read about a, a naval arc. William Francis Gibbs is kind of like the Elon Musk, the uh, Steve Jobs of the early 20th century, but it came to shipping. Uh, he's a guy who kind of a college dropout, uh, but became the best naval architect in the world. And it, it's just amazing. And, and when you read that book, the book is great because the first half is like a biography of, of, of Gibbs. The second one is about the SS United States, which is up in Philadelphia right now, decaying away. Uh, the fastest cruise ship ever to be built. Uh, last holder of the Blue Ribbon, the fastest passage across the Atlantic by a commercial ship, by a passenger ship out there. So I uh, really recommend that. And there is amazing work being done right now in terms of naval architecture and obviously in ship construction and ship propulsion. What's going to be the new propulsion that's out there for vessels? All right, let's go ahead to our next one. Uh, Mr. Jay Willis, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Super interesting. I, I, I Listen, uh, I want to thank everyone who has not just contributed monetarily to the page, but to subscribing and uh, supporting the page, it means uh, a, a huge element to me that I can get you out here to to, to support this. I'm, I'm always amazed. And so uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, no one to no one. Sal, I've been watching since the, your early days. You have been a great service to me and my company. Congrats on the success. And here's the many more. I appreciate that. You know, I, I, I'm really shocked at times. It was funny uh, when we started doing the Red Sea. I talked about the fact that these diversions were going to start taking place that we could expect. And I talked about Marist being one of the first. And I got a comment from someone. And again, I, I, I need to start writing this stuff down. But it was a great comment from someone who sat there and said, you know, I sat in a meeting the other day and I said, we should think about rerouting our cargo out of East Asia to the West Coast ports because of the situation that's developing in the Mideast. He goes, and I look like a genius. And it was because I, I watched your video. Not that I'm intelligent at all, but I watched this stuff. So I always uh, enjoy that. Uh, next, Tim B at C. So let's take a moment here. I am nothing. I am. A, I am a has been a washed up mariner, beached the shore, who gets to live vicariously through my friends who are at sea. If you want to follow a true, true mariner, a guy who who, who eats and spits out salt water by day. Tim B at C, go over to his YouTube channel right now, subscribe and like, I guarantee you, you'll enjoy it. Uh, you will sit there and, and, and be fascinated. Tim runs a tugboat, tug and barge operation. He is fantastic. If I have a question about tugs and barges, I go to him. One of my best things, I have a network I can go to from my alumni at SUNY Maritime to Mariners out there. And I always plug Mariners who have their own YouTube channel. I, I am not in competition. We are creating a network out there and tim is one of the best and tim's comment here what's the name of the choke point in the red sea wink wink i am thirsty so tim i i, I would be uh first off we're referring to the bob el mandab our in-house drinking game here in what's going on with shipping unfortunately this morning it's coffee i was up at one in the morning this morning for two hours i'm a volunteer firefighter captain's the only way i get to be a captain these days on my local fire department and we had a, a house with an ac unit or, or a heating unit that burnt up and so we had to go investigate the house so spent the uh, two hours last night in an attic under a house checking to make sure that it was safe for residents so and it can be clear about one thing too I had some comments in my last video because we were joking about the, the drinking game and some people took offense to it. They didn't like me drinking on the channel. They didn't like that I was taking light of it. Let me be clear. Number one, I, I don't take light of anything. Uh, I, I, I am a, a merchant mariner by training. I'm a firefighter. I, I have kind of a dark humor at times and I am going to talk about very serious topics, but at the same time, I also want it to be interesting and levity. Uh, and so I you know, I take things very seriously. I don't minimize the lives that are being lost because of the Israeli Hamas situation, what's going up in Russia, Ukraine, what's going on in the Red Sea. I don't minimize that at all. But I also don't want to be just a stodgy old 
man teaching and talking about shipping. I want to make it entertaining. I want to make it enjoyable. I want you to come back. I want every show to have something that's a little bit you're kind of looking forward to. And so I throw some levity into it at time. It's not always funny. I know that. I am not. I, I, the jokes don't always make. Uh, I've got to teach students on a, on a constant basis. And so I'm always looking at new ways to keep them engaged and entertained. And I can be a little bit more adult on this channel. And again, if you don't like what I'm doing, don't watch. Don't watch. Don't subscribe. It's great. Freedom. It's great. It's fantastic. All right. Let's go ahead and next uh, topic here. Andrew, is Starlink being used in shipping yet? Well, yes. Matter of fact, it is. There, there's more and more companies that are using Starlink. So one of the big problems that came out during COVID was the fact that mariners could not return home because of restrictions. The normal rotation of mariners didn't take place, which meant mariners were stuck on vessels for longer periods of time, which is a problem because there was no communication. We actually saw a wreck, uh, the 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 the, the, the walk Wachio, which went ashore in Mauritius, uh, because basically the ship was getting close to land to get cell phone reception. So we're seeing more and more the use of Starlink because this is what the crews are demanding. They want to be able to communicate. So we're finally starting to see that take place. All right, go over here to Jack. I found you through Drac and Dr. Clark. Thank you for educating us on shipping importance and uh Complexity. So those of you who don't know, uh, Drakinefell runs a fantastic YouTube channel. Uh, Drakinefell, Naval History. I remember just talking to Drak this morning. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Alexander Clark, same thing. Go over to their channels. Uh, Drak, uh, uh, Alexander Clark, Naval History, Armored Carriers. Uh, that's Jamie Slidell. The three of them do a podcast called Bilge Pumps. I have been on it way too many times. They're great. I'm kind of their American uh, bilge pump cousin, I guess, on that. And so we get to talk about it. Uh, Drac, uh, they were great for me in talking about starting up this channel. So I always give uh, all, the cr all the credit in the world to those three. They've helped me immensely. And one of the best things about YouTube and this network that we have is that we we, we share each other. I, we've been on each other's shows. We've talked to each other. I got to see Drac not too long ago up in Annapolis. Uh, I've talked to Jamie. I've talked to Alex uh, all the time on issues. It, it's really a great kind of uh, friendship. All right, let me go over to this question here. Now, this is from TS-GG9DK. Uh, does your insight in shipping make you invest in shipping companies on the stock market? So anyway, I kind of answered that a little bit earlier on that. I do do some investing, not a lot. Uh, I am asked at times to do uh, advising for companies, and I do that. I do get paid as an advisor, something that this channel has allowed me to do on the side. So I do give my perspective on shipping. Uh, shipping is a very difficult topic to you know basically learn about. If you're not exposed to shipping, if you're not really weaned on it, uh, it can be a bit intimidating at times. And so one of the things I like to do is is provide that service. I think I think it's a really important one. All right, let's go to the next question here. Edward Hardy, hey Sal, do you think the Panama Canal Company could look into desalin uh, desalinating ocean water and pumping it uphill into Katoon Lake to resolve their low water issues long term? Wow, you know, this whole story in the Panama Canal goes back to the root of that. There was examinations about desalinization in the Panama Canal for a long time. The issue here is poor water management in the Panama Canal. They knew this was going to be an issue. If you look at the low water levels they've had, it hadn't been an issue until they opened the new lane. The new lane Add, you know, if you look at the water usage per year, the new lane of the canal uses 25% of the water usage per year. That's the problem. And even though they have the reclamation ponds and they're reclaiming, they thought 80%, but it's really 50%. It's been a big issue. They need to do water reclamation for the old locks. They need to further dam up. They need to get better efficiency through the use of the locks. The problem with desalinization is it's really expensive. It's really, really expensive to do. And so you've got to invest in that and you need a lot of power to desalinize. And so uh, Panama has got to have the power output to go ahead and do that. I think it's one that definitely needs to be examined. I think Panama needs to look at it. The problem right now in Panama is this issue over copper mining and the that uses a lot of water too. And so there's competing uses for water in Panama. All right, let's go ahead to our next one. Uh, Mac, uh, is the U.S. state of readiness logistically for a two-pronged conflict, a Navy sales on logistics support? Look at World War II. And two, what is the true state of Great Lakes shipping? So uh, number one, 
Let's look at the logistics issue here. Uh, is the Navy ready for a two-pronged conflict? No, uh, not by any means at all. I think we're woefully unprepared for that, logistically speaking. I've done numerous videos talking about the underway replenishment fleet, talking about the surge sea lift fleet. These are the reserve ships that are sitting in the United States that would have to be activated. They're on average over 45 years old. The U.S. Merchant Marine is critically short of vessels. Our mariner pool is woefully understaffed. So, yeah, I think logistically we are in a huge problem. On the Great Lakes, Great Lakes shipping just reopened. A 66th season I think we're into now on the Great Lakes uh, for shipping. It is huge. Obviously, we're seeing vessels once again going. I don't think we pay enough attention to the Great Lakes. We just had a new vessel of our first U.S. new built vessel in, I don't know how long, 40 years built up in the lakes two years ago. Uh, we need to be building more ships. We need to be replacing the older fleet that's up on the Great Lakes. Canada has done that by basically deregulating, allowing foreign ships and foreign crews to come up there. There's a lot of debate about doing that for the United States. Do we want to put foreign crews up on the area? Uh, is that something that we think is a good uh, prospect? Uh, there's a lot of debate about that. So I am not sure... Uh, uh, how that is going to work out. I need to do more about the Great Lakes. It is such an interesting subculture. Uh, I am not a Great Lakes sailor. I never sailed up on the Great Lakes, so I'm always aware of my limitations. So, And, and I learn a lot. One of my favorite things about the channel is I learn so much, and I get great contacts all the time about it, but I will endeavor to uh, continue with that. Uh, from Complete Angler, are aircraft carriers irrelevant with all the ballistic missiles, drones, etc.? So that's a it's been an ongoing question. Uh, whether or not aircraft carriers are now obsolete. Uh, I think there's a lot of debate about that. I think there is. You know, one of the jokes about the Navy's 30-year shipbuilding plan is if you had a 30-year shipbuilding plan in 1890, it wouldn't have included dreadnoughts. If you had one in 1910, it wouldn't have included aircraft carriers. If you had one in 1940, it wouldn't have included uh, nuclear submarines. So we never know what the next technology coming ahead is. But aircraft carriers are extremely versatile. The big thing about an aircraft carrier is it is easy to modernize and update and change by putting new aircraft on them. And that is something we see all the time. So I, I, I'm not sure they're irrelevant, but I do think there is new technologies that are always threatening the aircraft carrier. Uh, there's a great book that just came out uh, on this, and I'll, uh, I'll put in the link in the show notes here. Uh, but it really talks about this issue about how do you deal with these new drone threats, missiles, a lot of threats out there. Uh, next question. Congrats on the third anniversary. Learned a lot about supply chain from you. Will we hear more about the business side of shipping this year? Absolutely. Uh, I know I get focused on kind of the news of the day, the Red Sea, but one of the things I try to do in my weekly, bi-weekly, what the ship is do that kind of updates on what's going on with shipping. Uh, just did that on the last episode where we looked at the container and tanker sector. So trying to make sure, keep up with that as much as I can. One person show here. So it's, it, it, it's, it's always a, a, com a competition for what story gets out there and what I can talk about from, oh man, from KP, uh, Again, talk about long, long followers of the channel. Uh, what are your children? Where? What? What are your children now? So I think he's asking, "Where are my children now?" Uh, that is the dogs. So my son's downstairs. Uh, he's downstairs, but my two dogs, uh, Maui and Peanut, uh, are are probably running around the house somewhere. I don't have them in here right now with me. And then the next question uh, from Courtney: Do you have a cat, a dog, a cat show? Is I have two dogs. I have two. They're not in the room right now. Uh, two gold doodles, Maui and Peanut. So they're kind of here all the time, in and out. Uh, Joe, double my money in tankers with this podcast. Thanks, Sal. Well, Joe, I appreciate that. I, I, I hope uh, that $20 is part of that uh, profits you have there. Uh, tankers have been an amazing watch right now. Uh, that is the sector that I think uh, has probably been the most uh, interesting to watch right now. Uh, there's definitely a, a lot going on on that side of the industry. Uh, I'm just really amazed all the time by the uh, uh, changes that we see happening there. I'm just running through some questions here as I go along here. All right, let me go ahead over to my next question here. Uh, live the future. Is there any long-term solution to the situation in the Red Sea? It seems to me we were a bit of an impasse, namely either back down completely or permanently deal with the Houthi threat. I, I think you are right. 
I, I, I think one of the things that uh, we're seeing right now is this issue about uh, uh, where do we go with this? Uh, the situation with the Houthi cannot be resolved solely by throwing missiles at it. I think that's a that's a misjudgment. You cannot use military as the sole uh, uh, solution to a problem. You have to have uh, multiple uh, um, uh, stakes at this. You have to come at it both politically, economically, but also militarily. I, I always go back to the issue with the Barbary pirates. The way we solved the Barbary pirates, even after they captured a U.S. ship, the USS Philadelphia, they imprisoned 307 Americans under Captain William Bainbridge, is we used a ground force in conjunction with diplomacy, but we still, at the very end, had to pay off the Barbary pirates. We had to give them $30,000, down from $300,000. Uh, I think we need to use some leverage against the Houthi. The problem is who has that leverage, and the only one who really has leverage to use against the Houthi is the Iranians, which we don't have great leverage with in any way, because the fear is if you give the Iranians any leeway, that becomes an element that's used politically against you, especially in this time when we're in the midst of a, uh, a political uh, 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 presidential election. Sorry, I don't know why I'm uh, uh, crashing my head there. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to next question. Uh, let's see what we got here. Can we ask about shipping stocks? Thoughts on Starbulk? Well, I, I am I'm very leery about giving that the biggest thing I always talk about with shipping right now is look at what the shipping company does. Uh, are you are you looking at bulk carrier? Starbulk, obviously a bulk carrier. Starbulk's uh, came under a lot of attention because of the Red Sea attacks. They were targeted by U.S. Uh, by the Houthi, which means they have to go the longer distance around, and that means ton miles. And let me be clear about something. One of my advantages I have in doing this show is that I am not beholden to the container companies or the shipping companies. Uh, shipping companies love and hate me at the same time. They love when I promote them. They hate it when I say things about them. So when the when the shipping companies sit there and say, we hate the Houthi, we hate what they're doing, uh, we, we, we disagree with them, understand they're making a lot of money because of the Houthi too. The routes going around Africa are elongating shipping routes. That means ton miles, tons have to go further distances, which means as they make percentages off freight rate, they make more money as the freight rate goes up. So Starbulk, which now has to divert vessels, they announced they're diverting the vessels, will have to go longer distances. Uh, if you go longer distances, you need more ships on those routes to carry the same tonnage. There's a finite number of bulk carriers out there. That tells me that bulk carriers are in a pretty good position right now. Same thing with product tankers. If you look at the tanker market, product tankers that are out there seem to be in a pretty good position right now. The issue with container ships is they're building container ships like crazy. And so you have surplus capacity out there. And that's their problem is they got too many ships. They need to scrap ships like crazy. And the fear is, I just don't think they're going to scrap them as fast as they need to be. All right, Pete Summers, how impressive is the Navy of India catching those pirates? Man, I, I've been utterly impressed by the uh, Navy of, of India. I think they've done a fantastic job. Uh, I think they are really trying to demonstrate their capability out there. Next question, thoughts on Mexico's proposed inter-ocean and a corridor uh, project to compete with the Panama Canal, Mexico's problem is its port infrastructure and its rail. That's always been Mexico's problem. Everybody thought with the backup in LA Long Beach, people would shift down to Mexico, offload cargo, come across the border. But because of the southern border situation and the rail situation we have in the United States, that's not a great prospect. It needs to be fixed. Until it's fixed, you're not going to get a good solution with that. Plus, you've got the container companies really working on workarounds uh, through the Panama Canal and the low water situation. Plus, you also had the deputy director of the Panama Canal sit there and say, this will be resolved by September. I don't know if she can predict the weather or not, but she seems to think that. I, I, I'm i holding out for rain. Next question. Uh, Maersk new ships that run on methanol, have you heard how they work and availability with bunker? So Maersk is making the play for green methanol. All the shipping companies are making different plays. Maersk kind of sat back and watched what was going to be the situation. They were waiting to see what the other companies did. So CMA, CGM went with LNG, but they did not commit for a long time 
to green methanol until they knew they had green methanol in place. So the Anamersk, the ship that just came into place, did a video on the very unique style of Anam Anamersk, that house all the way forward. It allows you to carry a lot of boxes. It's not a good looking ship. It's really not. The house all the way forward, miserable ride for the crew. Miserable. I would not want to be doing transoceanic passages on a, on a forward house vessel. Uh, I understand Great Lakers have them, but Great Lakers voyages are a heck of a lot shorter than a transoceanic. Uh, Anamarsk has green methanol set up. They're going to route them to places where they can get the cargo. Uh, that's a, a a big one. Next, uh, clear smash drop. Next can of freedom on me. I appreciate that. That was what we were drinking the other night. Uh, Nick Bars. Hey, Sal, thanks for the great content. Do you think the Salt St. Marie locks are a high priority strategic target for the U.S.? and Canada adversaries. So funny thing, I was doing research uh, on uh, World War II, and I was actually rereading Eisenhower's biography of World War II, uh, Crusade in Europe. And me, the beginning of World War II, Eisenhower was in the War Plans Division. He was a one-star general in the War Plans Division. And he talked about strategic targets in the U.S. And one of them he identified was the Great Lake, the Sault Ste. Marie Locks. He had U.S. Army forces on station there for fear of an attack on them. I think we fail in this country to understand what is strategic targets when it comes to shipping. We think military useful vessels are those that carry cargo. Uh, for the military, when in truth, it's carrying natural resources. So uh, I, I think that's a really important uh, uh, issue. And I think we saw that when the Canadian dock workers went on strike and shut down the locks on the Canadian side. That was a big impact. And again, I, I think we underrate the inland waterways of the United States all the time. I talk more and more about this. Mississippi's just just story in G-Captain uh, the other day, two days ago, talking about third uh, a fall, a third spring, where we're coming into really low water on the Mississippi. And this is going to impact trade and transit. All right, let's go to our next question here. Uh, Bruce Schmidt, love the shoe. <laughs> we were on board the Comfort together tonight. Wow, Bruce, good to have you. Good, always good to have a shipmate on board. I was on board USNS Comfort, the hospital ship, in 1990 during the Persian Gulf War. Uh, it's actually where I met my wife. She was a Navy nurse on board. So uh, uh, the two of us uh, serve together. All right, let me get these last sets of questions here. Then I'm going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately. I really appreciate everybody tuning in, and I apologize if I don't get to your question here. Uh, Thomas Ray, what do you think the role of autonomous drone ships will be in the future, both in military and civilian fleets? So, Tom, the military is making a big play for autonomous ships. I think in military roles, autonomous ships are great. I love the idea of an Arleigh Burke class destroyer sailing out there with three or four kind of uh, modified offshore support vessels, autonomously sailing around it with loads of missiles on board so that you can toggle off missiles from the autonomous ship and then put a crew back on it and sail it back to port to go reload. You turn one ship kind of into a series of satellites around it. I think it's great. I think it's, I think it needs to be developed more and more, I think the Navy needs to kind of be really bold in uh, embracing that idea. I think in commercially, we're seeing it done in a much larger measure. We're seeing right now the Norwegians running autonomous vessels coastally. Korea, Japan are huge in the autonomous market right now. I don't foresee, for example, autonomous ships sailing across the Atlantic and the Pacific with no crew on board. I don't think you'll ever be able to insure them. But I do see the diminishing of the number of crew on board. And I think that is uh, the big thing that we will see. All right, next question. Uh, Christy, will you cover illegal fishing off the coast of South America to protect the waters? Thanks for my content. My dad was a Green Beret, loves talking military ships and international shipping. First off, hats off to your dad for his service. Thank him for me. Uh, fishing is such a big topic. I would love to get into fishing. Unfortunately, again, it's a topic that I'm not the greatest in, and I got to find some great uh, sources for that. Uh, let me be clear. There are some great ones out there who do illegal fishing. I do follow it in the prospect of how China and other nations use the fishing it is a big initiative right now by the United States. One of the reasons when you ask questions like, why is the U.S. Coast Guard stationed out in the Pacific, for example? They are helping nations enforce their fisheries. It is a massive problem. Understand why Somali piracy took place in the early 2000s is because the Somali waters were a dumping ground for 
toxic waste for ships coming out of the Suez. They were dumping their waste there and it was overfished. And fishing is a massive issue. The Chinese fishing fleet off, off of uh, the Galapagos Islands, off the coast of South America, both the West and East Coast, is really important. China, in particular, is the biggest perpetrator of overfishing we see out there because they need such a huge amount of protein in their diet. They are just fishing the seas like crazy. Uh, Sussex Rail Enthusiasts, any news on MV Verity that sank last October in the North Sea? So I did a great video on that, uh, and I want to thank Marine Traffic for that. One of the interesting things was I did that video and I didn't have access to the full marine traffic. It's really, you know, the full access is a lot. But marine traffic came out, gave me full access. Huge supporter for the channel. So I want to thank him for that. Uh, allowed me to really put that up there. I thought that was a really interesting story because I had a lot of debate about that on the passing versus overtaking situation. Uh, I haven't seen anything on it. I'm waiting to see the final report on the investigation on that. So I have not seen anything on that all right let me check real quick last questions here as we go on uh, i, I want to thank everybody for being here uh, a couple of sources let me go over to this one right here got a couple of uh, last ones here i want to bring up here here we go uh de fortes thank you so much uh looking for some more here here we go uh, Global Source, thanks for uh, making the great channel and appreciate your objective and independent views. Cheers to another few Bow Bow Men devs. Uh, I, I appreciate that, Global Source. I, I do appreciate that. I, I want to take a moment and thank everybody for what they do for supporting the page. It, 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 it's very humbling for me. Three years ago, myself, John Conrad, got on this, this medium and talked about Ever Given in the Suez. And it has taken off since then. I think the last numbers I have is about 205,000 subscribers, 35 million views. Uh, there are a lot of great channels out there. I'm a big proponent and follower of her, uh, 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 Juan Brown over at Blanc uh, Cario. I always say his name. I always say the channel's name wrong. Uh, who does aviation, was a big supporter of mine. He got my name out there. I appreciate him doing that. Ward Carroll and his channel, uh, uh, Ryan Macbeth. Um, uh, Aaron over at Subbrief. There's a, there's a ton of guys out there who do uh, some great YouTube, and I really appreciate it. This is a love of mine. I really enjoy this. I enjoy this a lot. Uh, I, as you can tell from the channel today, I, I'm a busy guy. I, I run a department in an academic college. I do the faculty athletic representation for my university. I am the color commentator for my university's women's lacrosse team. Uh, I do, I'm teaching four classes right now this semester. So a little bit of an overload for me this semester. So I got to keep three classes at Campbell up. I got to do a class at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, uh, volunteer firefighter, a lot going on. But this channel has been uh, really uh, a joy to do. And I'm going to go back through all the comments here that have been provided by everybody. Uh, take a look at them. I apologize if, if, if I haven't gotten a chance to get to all your questions. I'll be sure to go through the comments here and try to answer as many of them as I can. Uh, I had a request to do these more often, and I, I like that request. I really do. Uh, I got to say we've had, I think it was watching the numbers. We were up to about 700, if not 800 uh, people watching this. Uh, I don't want to go more than an hour and I'm over an hour and eight minutes now. So I appreciate it. I had a lot of questions come in. I couldn't do. I, I, one of the people I want to make a comment on real quick here is Wendy Harbin. She sent me, she says seven questions, but based on the number of questions she had, it's more like 107. There were a lot of questions there, Wendy, that I, I just could not get to. So I apologize for not being able uh, uh to get to them. So I, I hope to do these more often. I will try to uh, do my best to do them. And again, I appreciate the support, just viewing, coming in, clicking the like button, subscribing, sharing it, giving it a thumbs up means more to me than everything else. Uh, I am this month, April, give you an idea of what this channel does for me. Uh, in April uh, 8th through 10th, I'm going to be in DC at the Navy League's Air and Space Expo, where I'm chairing a panel on the future of U.S. commercial shipping. Uh, it's going to be the vice admiral in charge of operations for the U.S. Coast Guard, the commandant of the, uh, excuse me, the superintendent of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, 
uh, the, uh, the the deputy commander for military sealift command. Uh, two industry leaders are going to be in it. Just crazy. Uh, just just in a crazy element. I'm heading down to New Orleans uh, in mid-April, about April 21st, to go give a talk to the American Merchant Marine Veterans uh, Association, another group I strongly recommend. Everybody go follow AMMV. They support American Merchant Marine Veterans. I'm a big proponent of American Merchant Marine veteran status. I'm going down there to talk about the U.S. Merchant Marine in World War II and talk about shipping. Uh, so I get to go down and do that conference. And then of all things, at the end of April, I'm heading up to DC once again to give a talk to a union uh, uh, meeting that they're having uh, about the uh, AFL-CIO, their Maritime Trade Division, to talk about how I use YouTube to talk about this. Because I believe the maritime industry uh, is doing not enough to promote the shipping industry and get younger people out there. I talked about my buddy, Tim B at sea. Uh, there's a whole batch of other maritime uh, maritime YouTubers out there who do it. I'm going to do a video uh, with just those guys I want and, and ladies out there and the role they play because there's so many of them out there that you should be following so that you can get the deck plate version of what's going on with shipping. So I appreciate everybody tuning in today. I'm sorry I couldn't get to every question. I will do my best. We will do this again in the near future, but hey, if you want more Sal, head on over to What's Going On With Shipping. Uh, be sure to subscribe and like. Check out the videos we just did. I've got a Red Sea update that's out there. We just did a video on the U.S. Navy 30-year shipbuilding plan that's out there. Uh, I got an update this week uh, on the Gaza Pier, on the vessels that are heading across. And we'll be looking at the newest information coming out on shipping in all the different sectors from across the board. So until next time, this is Sal, appreciating everybody tuning in, spending their uh, Sunday or Monday with me if you're across the Dateline in Australia. Uh, i got some fans over there in Australia and Singapore. Uh, appreciate everybody being here. And until our next episode, Sal, signing off.